All right. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Ashish Jha. I'm the Dean for Global Strategy here at the school and the Director of the Global Health Institute. And um, this is a particularly special day for all of us. Um, it's a special day because we do events, we mark important occasions, we talk about progress, we talk about problems, um, but we don't get enough of a chance to acknowledge uh, one of our own uh, and the impact that he or she has had in global health. This afternoon, we're talking about um, a really important and compelling issue. And even today, in 2018, if you look around the world, about 1 in 40, 1 in 50 people who will die this year will die from a complication of diarrhea. Right? That is a very large number. If you think about all the things that people die of, HIV, TB, malaria, diarrhea remains one of the biggest killers, especially among children. About half the people who die uh, in a given year from diarrhea or diarrhea-related illnesses are kids. Now, that number is terrible. It's about 500,000 total. Um, the good news is that it's down about 80% since 1980. We have made massive progress. Because before ORT, oral rehydration therapy, the use of oral rehydration salts came around, the thinking and the teaching and the logic was that you needed to give these people intravenous fluids. And if you're going to give people intravenous fluids, it's really expensive, it's often dangerous, uh, it's often just not available. So a lot has gone into changing that landscape. And I, the temptation for me is to talk to you about all of that stuff, but I'm not going to because we have the leading experts in the world, the people who were there at the beginning, who were the intellectual leaders who, who did the work to demonstrate the effectiveness of this stuff with us. So I'm gonna try my best not to take any of that away. I'm just gonna acknowledge before I turn it over to uh, David Malin. Um, I am just going to say that, that while we are going to talk about oral rehydration therapy, we are going to also talk about Richard Cash uh, and Richard's contribution. He's been a member of our community for a, a long time, a critical member uh, who's not, whose work is not only incredibly inspiring and impactful, but at every session, if you go to talks where Richard's there, he's the guy with the most insightful question. On every topic, Richard, on every topic, you've got the most insightful question. We love that. Um, so this is going to be a really fun afternoon. I'm thrilled to be part of it. It's jointly hosted by the Department of Global Health and Population and the Harvard Global Health Institute, uh, but it's really hosted by all of us uh, to talk about areas of, of big progress, how we came to be, and, um, and realizing that one of the pioneers behind it uh, has been a really critical member of our society and our community, Richard Cash. So uh, before I go any further, let me introduce you to David Nalen, who was um, uh, involved early on. Uh, he's a professor emeritus at, at Albany, and um, along with Richard, did much, much of the pioneering work that showed the efficacy of this stuff. Um, David, thank you so much for joining us. Dr. Bloom, distinguished panel members, guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. First, let's take a quick look at what we're talking about. A girl with acute watery diarrhea in Lahore, Pakistan, about 1980. We taught her parents how to pull the skin of her abdomen to test the elasticity. And if it stands up, you know she needs more work. And we told them to watch these two simple markers, and the mothers know about sunken eyes better than the doctor, and keep her drinking oral therapy. But she starts to take sips of the oral rehydration solution. She's getting a little more alert and holds on to her father's hand to make sure that it keeps coming. She's more alert, and she's beginning to look around at her environment and getting more active. So here she is when she started the ORT, or ORS, and we told them to keep feeding her. And here she is after her treatment, unfortunately still holding the mouth gadget that probably got her sick in the first place because in a highly fecalized environment, when they drop it on the floor, that's the start of the next episode. Anyway, we are here today to celebrate not just the 50th anniversary of the pivotal publication on the efficacy and method of oral rehydration and maintenance therapy for lethal diarrheal diseases, but also the 50th anniversary of a scientific partnership and a friendship which proved essential in delivering this life-saving advance. And it's variously called Cash and Nalan, or Nalan and Cash. <laughs> and uh, we cannot today, in the limited time, review the entire details of the history of ORT, which in any case has been meticulously documented in the uh, article by Joshua Rookson called The Magic Bullet, available as a free download on the web if you Google Joshua Ruxin, Magic Bullet. It's the longest article, the Journal of Medical History ever published, and it's beautifully documented. 
uh, from um, distilling the tape recordings of everyone who ever did anything and some people who didn't do too much. <laughs> so let's focus on how this scientific partnership came about and where it led. I will include some excerpts from my memoirs, uh, which is a work in progress. The year was 1967, and it was a strange year. <coughs> for reasons unknown, and uniquely for the only time since records had been kept, there was no cholera in Dhaka. Imagine a shortage of cholera. <laughs> so the entire clinical research unit of the Pakistan Sito Cholera Research Lab, or CRL, as the acronym went then, um, an acronym far less jaw twisting than that of its descendant, the ICCBRD. The entire CRL team descended on the remote village of Malugat in Cox's Bazaar, Chittagong, East Pakistan at the time, to respond to a call for help from the Memorial Christian Hospital, a remarkable missionary hospital, which is still active today. In that strange year of 1967, Cox's Bazaar was, at 80 miles long, the world's longest pristine beach, today home to almost a million Rohingya refugees from Burmese genocide. The missionaries had a problem. Cholera was in all the local villages, but the villagers preferred to let patients die at home rather than go for treatment to the Christian hospital because the local mullahs had told them, fearing conversions, that they would have the sign of the pig embossed on their forehead if they went there. <coughs> and so they chose to let their patients die in their huts rather than go. To explore the situation, the modest and self-effacing DG Health of East Pakistan, the late Mohammed Fahimuddin, visited the local police station, operated by a napping chief officer whose legs rested comfortably on his desk in front of Fahimuddin, until being informed who Fahimuddin was, DG Health, he scrambled to stand up at attention and dutifully reported a total absence of cholera in the area, which included Churinga, a small village built around the remains of a paved landing strip, a relic of World War II flying tigers flights into occupied Burma. Now used because the paved runway was convenient for threshing rice. There, the late Dr. Zaitl Huck and I found a nine-year-old Amina Khatun dying of cholera in her hut, her eyes deeply sunk, as you have seen here, pulse feeble, her cold, shriveled fingers being warmed by a pot of embers held by her father. Dr. Huck, <coughs> who was a native speaker of the local guttural Chittagonian dialect, argued with her father, persuading him, reluctantly at last, to give her an IV drip of 541, the then standard IV solution matching the electrolyte composition of color stool. And the IV fluid flowed in, and then within minutes, Amina Khatun's eyes began to fill out. Her pulse returned to strength, and she suddenly cried out, Pani, for water. She was dying of thirst. She was then brought to the MCH to complete her recovery, and hearing this, story, hundreds of patients followed, and as the epidemic waned and patients returned from the hospital, the word spread from Churinga down to Cox's Bazaar. This couldn't have been cholera at all. Nobody had died. The experience of being embedded in the afflicted area set the stage for key insights into the need for an effective and expensive available oral rehydration and maintenance therapy. A combination of an appropriate solution, absorbable, wedded to an appropriate clinical therapeutic method, and elimination of the standard NPO, nothing but us, rule then globally adhered to for diarrheal therapy, and replacing starvation therapy, or the euphemism is resting the stomach, which led with repeated episodes to filling marasmus wards in hospitals around the world, replacing it with ORT and rapid resumption of diet. Into this mix in that strange year of 1967 came Nalan and Cash, two green 26-something members of the noble order of the Yellow Berets. <laughs> <laughs> its offices included David Sacker, Bert Hershon, John Ruby, Lincoln Chen, and others, and it was a tag dubbed by some wag to label those who chose service in the PHS or the NIH or branch 
over Vietnam to fulfill their military obligations. This led to a lot of talent going towards medical research. <laughs> 1967, that strange year, um, uh, in that strange year, the, the initial prospects were not promising. The CRL favored sodium flux studies over practical applications, which were treated as tainted science. We discovered that every time we traveled out of Dhaka, Richard and I had a study room, but it would be seized by another branch of the lab. And we'd come home to find a bunch of our stuff in boxes and have to find a new room. Make, uh, finally, we figured out what to do. In the third room we were shifted to, we agreed to have installed an enormous steel balance that, uh, uh, scale. And um, this scale, embedded in cement in the wall, uh, made the room usable for nothing but our oral therapy study. And I'm happy to say that it probably should have a historical marker because it's still now buried within other rooms that have been built around it, present at the ICDDRB. So um, the formidable Ruth Hare, biochemistry section head at the CRL, assigned us to each oversee one of the ongoing protocols and to assist each other in a secondary role with each of our studies. These studies included an attempt at oral maintenance, an attempt to carry forward on the studies confirming Phillips' original observation that glucose uh, absorption uh, was intact in cholera. In fact, recent studies show that amazingly, cholera toxin and the cyclic AMP it generates actually significantly increase absorption of glucose and glycine, which are the solution which with glucose and glycine we actually tested back then. And uh, carrying forward on the studies that had confirmed Phillips observations, but with intermittent IV fluids and transintestinal intubation done by Hirshhorn and then by Pierce and the ICMRT in Calcutta, based on rediscovery of Phillips principle by David Sacker, who had a project to measure transintestinal potentials in cholera patient, and when he added glucose, the potential went up and, and came down. And that stimulated Bert to retest the idea of whether Phillips was right. Phillips, however, we didn't know this at the time, had been burned by a failed attempt at practical application in the Philippines around 1962, shortly after his discovery. <coughs> and so he didn't want Hirshhorn to move forward, and Bert coaxed him into saying, we won't do anything practical, but we'll check your observation. The problem with Phillips' original observation was a question of translational medicine and paradigms of causality and therapy. Recently, I stumbled on something I had, I had overlooked, along with many other people, in a 1976 article by Phillips called 20 Years of Color Research in JAMA. And buried in that article is why his study failed, because he states, that he thought that having observed the glucose effect, he could stop the cholera diarrhea if he gave enough concentrated glucose and saline. At that time, there was nothing known about dysregulation dis in cholera. But in later studies, it was observed that in the normal gut, sodium crosses into hypotonic or hyperotonic solutions according to its chemical rate. And in cholera, Absorption is blocked, so the only way to regulate it is secretion. So if you have high sodium in the gut, water pours in in color. There's a tremendous increase in secretion, but there's no absorption. And so, although there's been much speculation about why patients died in the Philippine trial, I believe it was because <coughs> huge amounts of water were pulled into this hyperconcentrated solution. Uh, sodium wasn't moving in because it moves according to its chemical gradient, even in color. And so they probably ended up getting severe hypernatremia and getting into cardiac and CNS complications. But we knew nothing about this at the time, and it's a good thing. If, we, if I had known all that at the time, I might have had second thoughts about moving forward. Um, the other study, um, so Ruth put me in charge of checking on this attempt at oral maintenance, which, since these studies were practical and tainted, had been handed over to our staff physicians. And so I was watching that study. And Richard was watching a study of intravenous acetate solution, uh, which would have the advantage that the standard bicarbonate solution was made up with non-sterile but BB grade bicarbonate, because bicarbonate is extremely difficult to sterilize. You need a, elaborate machinery with high partial pressure 
in order to keep the CO2 under control, and that wasn't available anywhere. So the acetate represented the first in a series of base precursors that were heat stable and could function as base precursors. Well, the oral study went on and it failed very quickly because although solution composition based on Hirschhorn's infused solution was uh, somewhat adequate, not impossible to use it, the therapeutic paradigm was unsound and the method fatally flawed. Thinking that oral therapy could only work in remote areas without doctors or the medical personnel and no measurements, Patients were given fixed amounts to drink hourly, regardless of diarrhea rates. This quickly led either to overhydration or underhydration. Patients losing two liters an hour and getting the fixed one liter an hour quickly went back into shock, study over. <coughs> Patients losing 250 ml and getting one liter an hour quickly swelling up and overhydrated. So it was a quick failure, and it was as I was being the newly arrived uh, medical resident chosen to over a hunch of these trained Bengali physicians. And being a kind of tabula rasa, I didn't have any negative prejudices about the situation. I was just learning intake and output, IV match, match the losses with equal volumes of a similar solution, IV. So it, uh, it's going over the under hydration, over hydration. I, it hit me that it had to work, but you had to match the losses with equal volumes of a similar composition, absorbable oral. That was the key insight. And um, Rich and I, constantly comparing notes across the two studies we were helping one another with, uh, discussed this, and Richard immediately, using a, co a common faculty of mind, which I've coined the word panangular visualization, meaning looking at a problem from every angle, visualizing it from every possible angle to figure out what the solution to the problem is. And we immediately agreed on a new protocol, which we carried out the following spring, and which was immediate success, I might add, while Phillips was traveling out of the uh, laboratory, and Kendrick and Ruth here uh, supporting us in his absence. Well, 1968 to 70 were better years than 67. There was a lot of color. We published additional studies of ORT in children. The first large field trial initially opposed due to Phillips' inputs at NIH but we overcame that with the help of Alex Langmuir at the CDC. The first use of glucose and glycine, a high osmolarity solution, which reduces cholera duration and volume of diarrhea to the same percentage as the later, more convenient, rice ORS, which also, rice hydrolyzed, contains glucose and glycine. These led to a lifelong commitment to global application and to establishment of national ORT training programs including the highly successful BRAC program in Bangladesh and the collaborative WHO, PAHO, and UNICEF programs towards uh, establishing national ORT training centers in Costa Rica, Jordan, and Jamaica, and Pakistan, where I was personally involved, and then by many of our colleagues with support from international organizations uh, spreading uh, the uh, treatment around the globe into, out of the hands of doctors and into the hands of mothers. And these colleagues have made many further important contributions, which I cannot go into in this limited time, reflecting their and our lifelong commitment to decimating diarrheal mortality. Thank you.